Hello and welcome to another YouTube exclusive of the Smash Accept podcast. I'm your host, Michael Royer. You can find me on Twitter at DynastyDadFF. Joined, as always, by my main man, FF Snoog. Today, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk running backs. We're going to talk top 12 redraft running backs. Snoog, this is the position that's going to win you money. This is the position that year in and year out, you know, if you look at it historically, outside the top four or five, you know, you have about a 60% hit rate on these top 12 guys. We're going to tell you who to do, who to draft, and how to get it right. Yeah, exactly. And one thing I want to highlight before we jump into it here is it's going to be full PPR. That's that's what we mainly play in. So we're going to focus on that. So in, in best ball underdog leagues where it's half PPR, things would be subject to change based on especially the guys that are like full PPR machines like Alvin Kamara and those type of guys. But we when when we look at the, the running back position from a full PPR perspective, seven out of 10 running backs last year had 50 plus receptions that finished in the top 10. So that is definitely a part that you need in your game in full PPR if you want to have that top 10 finish, unless you're JT or you're Derrick Henry that can score 15 touchdowns and put up 1,400 yards rushing. All right, so I got the first pick, and this is going to be interesting because, you know, you look at this is more I'm going to produce why this guy and not Christian McCaffrey. I look at Christian McCaffrey as a guy that can clearly outscore the rest of the field by 100 points. But yeah. you look at him, he has put up insane usage totals 550 touches over the last 27 games 28 years old now out there with that calf injury going to miss the entire camp and i think they've already committed where this san francisco offense wants to scale back on some of his usage someone who's not going to get scaled back on usage at all my first overall running back is Brees hall i'm comfortable taking Brees hall in 0.5 ppr as the one overall in standard, you know, as far as we're looking at PPR, I take him 102, 103, it, debating between Tyreek Hill and Brees Hall. Brees Hall in 2023, a lot of people forget he was coming off that ACL surgery. He was in in the first four weeks, he had less than 50% snaps, but five to 18, he just blew up. 20.0 fantasy points per game, second only behind Christian McCaffrey. 21.2 touches per game, second only to Christian McCaffrey. 76 receptions that's six plus a game snoog he was second only to alvin kamara this is someone who i think has an elite skill set that we have not seen the ceiling could be a thousand plus rushing yards and 100 receptions now you get aaron Rodgers. the red zone carries are going to be a lot more elite the opportunities are going to be there and rather than take christian mccaffrey who we're starting to see towards the trail end of his career with those injuries i'm taking Brees hall with my first running back in 2024 to smash yeah, I love that pick because Brees Hall is a guy that you, when you look for these running backs to have those big RB1 overall seasons, you're looking for the talent, you're looking for the opportunity, and you're looking for the receiving upside. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Dad, clear path, to, uh, clear path to workhorse upside there for the Jets. He's the clear guy there. He's going to see 300 plus touches. First in receptions, people, first in receiving yards last year. I mean, oh, he yeah. checks every box. People are going to think that I set you up with a layup here, but this is something that I've been putting on Twitter everywhere that Brees Hall is that guy for me. So go ahead. Christian McCaffrey, RB2 of the of the 2024 season, has to feel good for you, though. Yeah, I mean, for me, I just put up my top 10 rankings. I had CMC1. I just think he is the best fantasy football player we've ever seen, especially at the running back position. I mean, five, five out of seven years in, in his career so far, he's put up 20-plus points per game. Seven out of seven of those years, he's put up 70-plus receptions on pace. He missed some time, but he was pacing ridiculous numbers there in the receiving game. He's had a couple hundred reception seasons. Lead offense, first in touchdowns last year, first in team target share at the running back position. He was RB1 in points per game last year with 24 and a half. I mean, he just checks every single damn box mm -hmm. that you want as a league winner. Until this dude shows me he can't get up and go to work no more, then, then, then I will officially drop him past the RB1 overall. But, I, I mean, he's just so damn good. And if Ayuk leaves, there's even more opportunity there. He's always mm -hmm. injured. So I'm just not even going to look at the injuries. I'm not going to think about it anymore. Because when that happened two years ago, people were like, ah, oh, CMC's washed. He's done. Can't stay healthy. Two RB1 straight finishes there in San Fran. They're going to use him properly. They're going to get other guys involved. They got Debo there to mix in. So I'm excited for CMC. Yeah, and the next guy, again, now this is not Dynasty rolling over. You know, these are some players that I think 
I like to draft guys that I think have elite level upside to go above and beyond. Bijan Robinson last year showed on a touch basis how electric he truly is. Fourth in missed tackles, fifth in yards uh, created, you know, ninth in yards per touch. But what you look at is what he was able to do. He was top seven in rookies all time in targets, receptions, rushing yards, yards per carry, all those metrics. And what you really is baffling is because of Arthur Smith, he was in a 53 47 timeshare with Tyler Algier. Tyler Algier is a nice running back, but he's not Bijan Robinson. If Bijan Robinson gets a 70 30, 65 35 type split, this is someone who can take the workload and now has an offense where he's got Kirk Cousins. Very much where I'm looking at, you know, Aaron Rodgers helping the Jets. I think Kirk Cousins rises all the tides here. I think Bijan Robinson is a guy that could easily get. 70 to 80 plus receptions over a thousand yards and b what we look at is when a guy is rb1 overall he has to have 18 touchdowns historically over the last six seasons and i think in this offense b john robinson could touch that yeah exactly yeah i think b john robinson's and one of those other guys just in the contention for rb1 overall i mean the offensive line's there they got kirk cousins there so the quarterback play is going to be 10 times better you're looking for these guys with these elite three down skill sets, these guys that can catch 50, 60, 70 plus passes and score 10 plus touchdowns. If you can do that to me, you're in the RB1 overall contention. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy, he third highest target share amongst running backs. Like he was just absolutely phenomenal as a rookie, even if it didn't show that as much on paper, still finished in the top 10. I mean, he was a guy that we saw him flash that elite talent. Like he had a couple outstanding plays where he broke like seven people's ankles. Like, He's going to just get more comfortable and better with this. They got a new offense or new defensive style head coach. So you're going to see them running the ball a lot more, a lot more play action. But jumping in here to the RB4, I mean, this is pretty on brand with me. I'm going to go with the last of the tier for me here. So this is the tier break. I think these four guys all have exactly what I said earlier. That 50, 60, 70 plus reception upside. But they have the potential to lead the running back position in receptions and score 10 to 15 touchdowns. It's Jameer Gibbs. This is a guy that had double digit touchdowns as a rookie, paced 60, 70 plus receptions as a rookie, finished in the top 10, 16 plus points per game, elite offense, Vegas sports books everywhere around has the Lions as the top three to four offense this year. They're going to score a ton of points. Jameer Gibbs is going to be probably one of the most highest point scorers on that team in general, probably right there with Amon Ross St. Brown. And he, he's just an absolute monster. I mean, the elite speed, the athleticism, the, mm -hmm. the way that they're going to use him more in space. They've been using him more in the slot this year in training camp. I'm excited for him. I mean, I got that. It's too far away, but I got the signed jersey getting ready to get hung up right behind me. It's over there on the floor. So I'm excited. One of my favorite players in the league, if not my favorite. So let's jump into this next, next guy yeah. here. I think the one thing that has to be said before we move on to that is I think a lot of you guys are getting confused on playing hero with your hero RB when it comes to your draft. I think Brees Hall and Christian McCaffrey are the only guys you play hero ball with. You take that running back and then you don't take another one to round four or round five. If you're, I have Bijan and Gibbs in it, like a mini tier right underneath those because I don't think that with those guys, I want to make sure I get another running back early. I want to make sure I get one more guy to really solidify that room because we haven't seen it yet. Both of them have tremendous upside. I think Hall and McCaffrey, though, are those guys that I'm going to hang my hat on. The next guy that I'm hanging my hat on at the RB5 is Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor was the RB1 two years ago. You know, Last year, you looked, he still has that RB1 overall upside. But it took some time. You know, he was dealing with a new system, a new quarterback, multiple different quarterbacks. He was dealing with that that you know injury that he had coming out of camp. And Jonathan Taylor didn't look like the same guy the first seven games. The final eight games of the season, though, averaged 17.8 fantasy points per game, 155 carries, 704 yards, seven touchdowns. And we start to see that guy seven touchdowns in the last eight games. And now you look at what he could possibly do with Anthony Richardson. And I see this as a scenario where we kind of look at what Lamar Jackson has been able to do for the running backs in his area. Because Anthony Richardson is very comparable to Lamar Jackson when it comes to the red zone. He's going to get his. He's going to rush, but we saw Gus Edwards score 13 touchdowns. We yep. saw, you know, Justice Hill score touchdowns. I think Jonathan Taylor is a 15 touchdown plus kind of upside guy. And at this point, you're getting him in that late first, early second. And I think Jonathan Taylor could really smash that ADP and become a really nice value. Yeah, anytime you get the opportunity to have a guy running behind a great offensive line who's an elite talent, elite athlete, just a, a monster pure rusher, and he's got... 
the weapons and the coaching staff and Shane Steichen there behind him to support him, like you're going to get production. If he stays healthy, top five, top six mm -hmm. finish locks for JT. I'm going to jump into the next guy here. And I think this is the tier, right? So we had the first four guys and now we're in that tier with Jonathan mm -hmm. Taylor, the guy I'm about to say, and the next guy after here. And then I think it's another tier. So mm -hmm. these three guys, what they all have in common is they're all going to see that elite workhorse volume. And it's Travis Etienne here for me. He's my RB5. I have him over Jonathan Taylor just for the upside in the receiving game and full PPR. 50-plus receptions last year. He actually hit 58. I think there's a chance he sees 65 to 70 this year. He still mm -hmm. has double-digit touchdown upside like JT does. He has the potential to get 300-plus total touches like he did last year. 16.5 points per game last year, but he was in the 20-plus point per game range through the first 10 weeks before Trevor Lawrence started to absolutely suck. The offensive line got hurt, and the team just fell off a cliff. Back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons as a, as a rusher. First in broken tackles. They said that they wanted to get Travis Etienne involved a lot more this year. Travis Etienne said that they're going to unlock his game complete. He feels more complete when they're using him as a receiver. Right away down in the red zone yesterday, we saw him with a beautiful Texas route. They've been practicing that. They're getting Travis Etienne involved. He's going to be one of their top, if not the top playmaker down in the red zone. He was outside the top 15 in red zone touches last year. Like This offense struggled to get to the red zone. And Travis Etienne still had so many touchdowns. I think he had like 14 or something total touchdowns. Like... The thing that separates him and Jonathan Taylor in full PPR is Jonathan Taylor's never getting 60, 70 catches. That's the difference. No, like 40. JT's probably 30, 40. ETN's probably like 60, 70 as ceilings. Mm -hmm. That's like 30 points alone and just receptions of a difference. Like yeah. ETN will make up in the in the receiving game what he won't make up with like 1,700 yards rushing if JT hits that. But we've seen Travis Etienne be hyper-efficient in the run game, so I'm excited to see him bounce back there and bump his efficiency with a healthy O-line. Yeah, and to end that tier, and this is the last guy that I think can really threaten for that RB1 overall. There's another guy that's kind of close, but everything has to really hit. Saquon Barkley. Saquon Barkley is a rookie tied for RB1 overall with Christian McCaffrey. Then he goes to you know this anemic offense. That Giants offense fell off. In his five <laughs> seasons with the Giants, though, four out of five seasons over 16 fantasy points per game. Five out of five over 50 receptions. Five out of five with over 70 targets. Now he goes to an offense that's top five graded in rushing offensive line, top five in most runs per game. And we had a floor last year of DeAndre Swift with 229 carries and 49 receptions. If you take that as a floor and then you add the talent of Saquon Barkley, and yes, a lot of people are going to say, well, what about the tush push? I think we have a different offense here with Kellen Moore that's still going to be involved, but I think Saquon Barkley could easily see double-digit touchdowns like he did last year, easily get 60 to 70 receptions, and could be the RB1 overall. Like He's a dark horse guy there where I think when you look at the Kellen Moore offense compared to what they've been running last year, he's going to get more receptions. Jalen Hurts looks like himself again. I think Saquon Barkley is a locked and loaded top six running back for 2024. Saquon Barkley is one of the best receiving backs in the game. If you look at it from just a talent perspective, I mean, he's got elite hands. He can move well. He's He's got a route tree. Like we saw that as a rookie at the Giants. Back-to-back 280-plus -back touches. Everyone says uh, Jalen Hurts doesn't check the ball down. You're going to see a lot more manufactured receiving touches yeah, for Saquon. Swift had 49 Moore receptions. There. Yeah, so it's exactly. not like it that's doesn't such exist. a high floor, dude. Like yeah. 49, 50 receptions is like that floor you want. Yeah, mm -hmm. he has that upside to be a 60, 70 guy, especially with Callum Moore. He's going to be a lot more manufactured. Like you're going to want to get the ball to Saquon. Jumping into this next guy here, I'm chasing full blown upside after these seven guys. Like if I want a league winner, if I want a guy that's going to be a huge game changer with me, it's Devin A. Chain for the, for the Dolphins, obviously. Elite offense, last year he had 7.7 .7 yards per carry on over 100 plus touches, 90 plus total yards per game. He was first in fantasy points per opportunity. This guy was an absolute efficiency machine with Mike McDaniels in this Dolphins offense. First RB ever to post 7.5 plus yards per carry on 100 plus touches. Like he was, he, he forced 25 missed tackles on less than 175 attempts. Like, he was just absolutely elite. And I went through and I removed all games because he had a couple games he played a couple of snaps and then didn't play. If you remove all the games where he played more than 10% of snaps, he averaged 20 plus points per game as a rookie. Mm -hmm. I think the, it's only going to go up if Raheem Mostert goes down. Yes, Jalen Wright's going to fill in that role, but 
Achain's just going to play more in that case. Like you're going to see more Achain on the field when an injury happens to Raheem Mosa or if Raheem Mosa is slowing down because he's older. Like you're going to see more and more Achain. One thing that I went through, I noticed when you're looking for running backs with a lead upside, it's literally how good's the offense? Are they going to score a ton of points? What are they going to be involved with? Mm-hmm. Is he going to get the touches? And does he have touchdown or receiving upside? He has both, even though the receiving upside didn't speak for itself last year. But the touchdown upside, the offensive success, and just the manufactured touch there with Mike McDaniels. I'm all in for Achain. Steal in, in that second, third round of your fantasy drafts if you're trying to go for a wide out in round one. Yeah, and I think this guy is as well as you, you You hit the nail on the head when you said you either want elite level touchdowns or receptions. For here, this pick, it's touchdowns. Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry has been the absolute best in the league over the last five years of scoring touchdowns with 120 over the last five seasons. That's absurd. You know, like he has just been um, incredible. And this is someone that I think we have not seen the true touchdown upside because he has not been on an elite level offense. Now he is. Gus Edwards last year, 893 yards and 13 touchdowns. That is the floor for Derrick Henry because Derrick Henry has done that on horrible offenses. Now you get him in the red zone with Lamar Jackson. I think he's going to rush for upwards of 18 touchdowns. I think he's going to throw for two like he always does, you know, where they get him into the end zone. People start keying in. He's going to get a couple tosses to Mark Andrews. And I think Derrick Henry, we always say, oh, this is the year where he doesn't do it. This is the year where he doesn't do it. Now he's in Baltimore. This is the year where he absolutely smashes it. This is like his Sistine Chapel because I think he's going to take them to the next level. Yeah, even in full PPR, he just has such a such a high floor just because of the touchdowns. And standard, you give him a bump up, right? Right? You want mm-hmm. him above these some of these other guys that we're relying on. Like he's over ETN, he's over these guys because he's gonna get more touchdowns and probably as many rushing yards, if not a little bit less. I yeah, would love the standard. Jump. He's he's yeah. he's yeah he's right there with JT. Yeah, you, know, you know you you got to debate back and forth a little bit. Yeah, I'll jump into my next guy here. Another guy. I'm, purely chasing upside with i'm gonna go with kyron williams i mean like i said earlier right we're looking for those good offenses with those running backs that have the opportunity and they have either the touchdown upside or the receiving upside i'm a big blake Corum fan i think blake Corum's gonna eventually be a knife in the side of kyron williams but i think if kyron williams is healthy he's worth the upside of where you can get him where he can be a league winner. Like if you can get him in that three, four turn or even that like early third round and you go back to back wide outs and you just want a high upside shot on an RB with a high floor and, and a high ceiling, it's Kyron. Cause I mean, 21.3 points per game last year is RB two, fourth of red zone touches. He's outside most people's top 10 right now, redraft ADP or close to where we have him, like eight to nine. And he's just a guy, double digit touchdown upside. I only played in like 13 games and had like 15 touchdowns. If Kyron Williams played a full 17 games, Dad, I think he would have put up a ridiculous season where everybody would just be like, holy shit, he's actually him. Like, he's so good. I don't care if Brett Coram's there, right? And like, it's tough for us because we were we liked Blake Coram, but I mean, Kyron had an 83.9% snap share last year. That's coming down. I, I'll guarantee you that's going to be probably yeah, 70, get, high the 60s. RB2 overall last year, now yeah. at RB It's just nine, worth it, 10. right? It's just worth it's, the upside. It's, it's now worth it. You know, and the yeah. other guy is, is Joe Mixon. And there's been a, a theme to a lot of my guys is different quarterbacks, different situations. Guys elite that offenses. Are gonna, uh, elite. Thank you. That's the key, right? That's the like key they've right gone there. to that. So mine is Joe Mixon. And I know the hamstring injury worries me a little bit because I that just like what I talked about with Christian McCaffrey, Injuries to 28-year-old running backs at this point in the season really are worrisome. You know, yep. they, hopefully they rest, they take care of them. But I think they're going to unleash Joe Mixon. They're going to get him more involved in the passing game than what Cincinnati was. What he's been able to do since he joined the league in 2018, RB10, RB13, injury season, RB4, RB10, and RB6. He goes from one of the least efficient and the least athletic offensive lines with that raw score all the way down at 4.11 now he goes to the texans at 8.26 and you look at their pff grades from the 23rd best offensive line to the eighth this is a guy that if he stays healthy in 2024 is going to win you money he's someone that right now you can get in the fourth round you know if i take Brees hall in the first and then smash two wide receivers get myself you know 
get yourself a Marvin Harrison Jr., a you know, a Nico Collins, then in the then you get Cup and Debo in the third, and then you come back and you get Joe Mixon, you are loaded with two RB ones, two wide receiver ones. I think Joe Mixon is going to be potential for a top five season in this offense. Yeah, and, and, and we're gonna keep it on brand here because you know you know that dad and I have been really big on these two veterans. Joe Mixon's one of them. The next one's Alvin Kamara, and we'll throw him in. He's my RB10, but we'll throw him in at RB11. I have him over Mixon. I have him over Henry in full PPR for one reason. Last year, paced 98 receptions. RB3 in points per game last year. They brought in Clint Kubiak, so they finally got a good offensive coordinator coming from that Shanahan tree. He was the passive game coordinator over there in San Fran last year. He's used to CMC. He's used to dialing in those play calls, getting the passing offense coordinated and ready to go getting the running back involved Derek Carr that's the one thing that's not changing Derek Carr is a check down machine the offensive line is bad that's gonna that's a thing he's not gonna be efficient in the ground game we know this it's been like that for the past two to three years they've been so banged up on that offensive line they've been digging into second and third stringers there for Camara, so it's been tough for him to get things going on the ground 70 plus receptions he's had in five out of seven seasons 19.3 target share last year tied first with cmc he has been he's averaged 17.8 points per game in six out of seven seasons in his nfl Mm -hmm. career like he has always been an rb1 he's never finished outside the top 10 in the points per game if if you remove this one season where he played like two percent of snaps in a game and had zero points that they count for so i removed that but when he's playing over like 30, 40% of snaps, yes. If you look at what he's going to be in that Saints offense next year, it's going to be Chris Olave, Alvin Kamara, Derek Carr checking the ball down. Kamara's always going to get his manufactured touches. He had mm-hmm. seven total touchdowns in, in, in 13, 12 and a half games last year. We could see 10. Like 10 total touchdowns is, is very safe for a player like that, especially with the manufactured touches he gets. Kendry's injured. Jamal Williams stinks. Probably not going to see much Taysom Hill with Clint Kubiak now. I, I think it's just an easy one for me. Just easy. Like, if you could get 80 receptions to the floor, you don't even need eight touchdowns, and you're going to finish as an RB1. So that is our top 12 redraft running backs. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. Hit that smash subscribe button. We're putting out YouTube content daily. We put things out as far as, you know, our, our podcasts, all those different things. Make sure you guys follow at Brock Dynasty. He does a fantastic job on the edits and, and kind of putting things together for us. So thanks again for tuning in, guys, and enjoy the process.